good morning and welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied voice and hands, Justin and John. <laughs> both both the J's with us today, I think. I, at least I, I didn't hear anything from Justin, so maybe he's not with us and we have John instead. Either way, it's good, right? Good morning, everybody. So there's a tree management company parked right outside the window. I have the window open, so if they start doing like things with saws, then I'll close the window. <laughs> Justin is at the doctor. Okay, okay. Uh oh, hopefully Justin isn't having like, you know, terrible things happening to him or anything. You just never know with that boy. All right, let's get Ashana out of there. Get our orange out of there. Not nah, just a checkup, just to make sure he's still Justin. Aliens haven't taken him over. Gotta have one of those checkups to, to make sure you're still yourself. Oh dear. So, so guys, I have to submit my ReaperCon classes today and David and I are both going to do it. John will be pleased to hear this as he reminded me yesterday because I keep forgetting. Um, so, so if there was one class, one, you want Anne to teach at ReaperCon, what would it be? And then we can put up a poll. <laughs> yes, Invasion of the Justin Snatchers. Well, as long as they're only snatching Justins, I feel safe. I wonder what percentage of the population are Justins. And if it's enough to make a difference, like if, it, if all the Justins turned against us, would it make a difference? Like, or could we easily overcome them? NMM the Anway? That's a new one. Haven't had one. Haven't had anybody request that from me. Good on. Got to keep some notes. NMM. An an -an -m -m. <laughs> Something like that. I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't know what the Josh battle is, so. Another color theory class? That seems to be what people want from me. I can't imagine why. <laughs> Maybe because I can wa talk for four hours on it. Another color? Okay, color theory. And then, and then, and then, and then. But you're not going trouble, huh? Well, I'll put color theory down anyway. This is all just, you know, questions from you because you guys are, like... Reaper fans, and so I value your opinion. Because I'm pretty sure that I know one of the classes I'm teaching, but I want to I want to hear what you guys think. How to unjudge and, and enjoy painting. Oh my god, you want me to teach a painter's self-help class, Kurniko? <laughs> How to unjudge painter's self-help. <laughs> that would be funny. I bet I could put together a curriculum for that. That would be really funny. It would be even funnier if it sold out. <laughs> okay, you'll be there next year. That's awesome. Because you know without trouble, it's not a party. I'm sure that Reaper will get in plenty of trouble without trouble, but still. Still. There's, there's, there's appearances. Yeah, be helpful. Well, and, and if you guys think you'd like to see me teach it, then probably somebody else does too, right? Oh, Cinco de... Is it Cinco de Steco? Oh, that's right. You did the margarita cupcakes. Playing <laughs> mariachi music. <laughs> you did not notify the rest of the office that you were doing it. <laughs> nice, Nomad Zeke. Nice. Style points. Style points. It's like taking... It's like marching down to the principal's office and taking over the intercom. You take trouble to whole new levels. Yes. Yes, you do. The authentic. You're a very authentic form of trouble. So let me see here. I'm going to get out colors for, uh, what am I feeling like today, guys? Oh, I really like this smoke. I just, I look at the smoke and I'm happy. Like, I'm happy with the smoke. I think it turned out really, really well. I think that we lost a bit of the green and the orange. I think mostly what I'm seeing is like pinky, pinkish orange and then yellow and then purple. And then, of course, the blue. But I think I'm really happy with this. I think I'm really happy with this. So yeah, let's work on let's work on um, hitting our NMM because then we really only have to do all these clouds on the back, which will be more smoke and fun stuff. So we like smoke and fun stuff. I'll think about doing the hair as kind of a kaleidoscope. Maybe I'll start shifting it away from white and toward pink as it goes down. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, let's finish up her front. Um, let's get our NMM. I was using NMM gold highlight very heavily here with some lantern yellow and we were uh mixing colors with clear magenta and a bit of brown liner all i have to do is look at it and i know what i've been using 
All right, so there. And then we're probably going up with white. And I haven't popped the whites on a lot of this yet, so I need to. Um, so we need to get our pure white. There. All right, so our and nim 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 colors. Nim 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 nim. Oh, let's put them in order. There. So we're doing this because we can mix that credible orange with these things. We can shade our yellow with purple. Um, since we're using lantern and magenta, it works. Um, I like to mix magenta and brown for a bit of a shadow. I find that that works off of the magenta shading and brown liner and magenta mixed together make a very sexy color. Um, so that's what we're doing. And we always have to bring it up, always have to bring it up to pure white. There's no exceptions on that. You've got to. Otherwise, it doesn't look shiny. It's that simple. So if you remember nothing else about NMM is that you must bring it up to pure white. And the second thing to remember is that you must punch your shadows down. They must be really dark if you want it to look shiny. Otherwise, it won't look shiny. Do a limited palette class. That would be fun. Limited palette painting. I'd have to work, I'd have to do some work to get that one together. But I'm gonna add that to my overall ideas. I might do a workshop on that sometime, cause that could be fun. Morning Jabberwock. All right, well let's get this geared up. Uh, we wanna do straight NMM, our base coat is straight NMM gold highlight. How to use clear brights is pretty much the color theory class trouble. Because uh, when you're demoing how pigments work together and, and don't work together, you, I, I, you use the clear brights. Hey, Miniatures Den, raiding with Giganto Raid. Dang. Thank you, Luca. Alpaca Pack, welcome. Alpaca Pack? Alpaca Pack Pack. I don't know. We're doing NMNMNMNM and, 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 and Alpaca Pack 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 Pack. So, 201 people. That's insane. Right, but you can have a sheen. Uh, you Okay, so NMM. Ad, uh, Nomad Zeke is curious how you do NMM adamantium then, since per D&D lore it gives a green sheen under candlelight. Um, you could do that. You would just put the green sheen in your next highlight down. You wouldn't, and maybe even a tiny bit of your mid, of your mid. Um, to kind of slide it that way, but you still need, if Adam, if adamantium is a shiny metal, which I don't know, is it, is it dull or is it shiny? Cause some metals are more dull, even under, you know, you can't polish them to quite as bright a finish, right? So if adamantium has the potential to be a shiny metal, and if you are using it and wherever it appears, it would be a shiny metal, you have to go up to white because you're not, what you're talking about, Nomad Zeke, is that the, the metal takes on a sheen of green under a certain specific type of light, candlelight, which makes sense. Candlelight is yellow, orange, over black, it's going to go greenish. Um, but what you're not telling me is, you know, the finish, because what you're suggesting with your bright white highlight on NMM is the finish of the stuff. It's not the actual color of the metal, it's the light bouncing off of it. That stays the same. Hey, everybody. Yes, thank you for the raid. Yeah, NMM Adamantium is what Nomad Zeke asked about. It's a very black metal, so you keep a lot of it black, but you still need to, if it's a shiny metal, you still need to find a way to have those bright white highlights and suggest that shine and a little bit of reflection. You just keep most of the surface black. Well, then you're just doing, like, special effects weird stuff. Like, I, it, when you're starting, yeah. So you'd either go green or purple, depending on what your light source was. Well, apparently D&D has. <laughs> apparently D&D has considered what color adamantium is. So what we're doing today, guys, uh, just for all the newbies. Hi, I'm Anne. I work for Reaper. This is my pro tip show. We do it every weekday morning um, at 1130 a.m. USA Central Time. And today is our genie day. Um, we were putting colors in her smoke the other day. I had to get in focus. Focus, Anne, focus. There we go. Um, and today I really want to finish up some of this gold, kind of dawn colored gold that I've got going on on her. And... Um, deal with the little lamp down here so that we can move on to the back of the figure because I mostly have gotten the front of the figure where I want it um, and the back is like totally undone so we need to get onto that and I need to putty up the hole in her butt which is where her sword goes except I'm not a big fan of the sword and so I'm not going to use it. <laughs> we do a different model every day we have a six model rotation so eventually everything gets painted and done um, but we switch it up from day to day.
Yeah, but the the point stays is your white highlight on metal doesn't reflect the color of the metal. What it reflects is the the light that is reflecting off the metal. So if your metal is shiny, you must have the white. And you must also have a dark on there, some sort of shadow, to give you that shiny thing. Like, you'll get that even on a ferrule. You can see the white stripe down the middle. You can see a really dark shadow on the underside. You can see a secondary shadow and a secondary highlight on the upper side. And if you put something down here, you'll even get a reflection. Like, you can see it reflecting the color of my hand. Now, this is like chrome. It's like super shiny. But the point holds. Uh, just green stuff, probably, AKT. Because I'm really comfortable with green, and I'm comfortable, I'm pretty sure that I can get it um, to smooth out nicely. Uh, but you could also use something like Milliput, the fine Milliput, which smooths with water, or um, uh, epoxy, Aves Epoxy Sculpt, which is what I like a little better than Milliput, um, which also smooths out. Any putty will work. If, it's, if you really are dubious about whether you can get it to smooth into this really smooth surrounding area on her derriere, um, then you want to use something that you can sand maybe after it's, after it's done. Uh, green stuff's not great with sanding. I mean, you can sand it. It's just not as, you know, you, I think you can get a smoother result on some harder putties. Um, so you, really, you can use anything really. It's what, what are you comfortable with? What do you think you can get a good effect with? That's really, that's the answer to anything in miniature painting. Like there is no, no ultimate answer. There is what I would use, what you would use. What are you comfortable with? What do you think will work for you? So now we're going to mix our kind of our orangey brown color and we're, um, we're shading our yellow with purple today. We're using a clear magenta and lantern yellow mix. Let's see here. I'm just checking up on all you guys. Oh, okay. Now we're talking superheroes. Of course, whenever adamantium comes up. So the reason that this goes brownish is because we're using two different kinds, uh, two different like cool versus warm pigments. So if you want to mix a really nice orange, you want to use a very warm orangey red. But instead, we're going with the cool purpley uh, color, purple red. Uh, clear magenta is a very cold red. Um, and we're using a very warm yellow. When you cross the streams like this and use a warm color with a cool color, you will not get a bright result. It will mute out. In this case, I want it to mute out because I want to go more toward a brownish color because I still am doing gold NMM. So I, I still want to get to a point where I feel like uh, I'm getting a, a relatively you know, gold color. I want it to be a little bit more ethereal, which is why I'm using magical shadows. Um, as far as my colors go, I'm not using any earth pigments or, or something, uh, you know, I'm trying not to bring it too far down to earth with this model because she's really made of clouds. But, <laughs> but yeah, when you mix a cool color and a warm color, it's going to mute. It's going to get muted. If you want a bright color, like, that's why if you want a really good green, you mix a cool Green, cool yellow with a, with a cool green. Although, actually, you could go warm green with that, but not too warm. I guess I'm being confusing. Anyway, we're getting this color thing going on. I could go on, but I need, like, I need a two-hour class to talk about pigments because there are exceptions, and there are generalizations, and there are all the things you can do. So that is an orange, and it's not terribly muted. It's not too bad. I'm going to add a little bit more of my magenta in to darken it down. There we go. And then my other shadow that I was mixing is going to be um, some brown liner with magenta, which really makes a kind of a really neat color. Hello, Daffod Weir. Thank you for the resub. 19 months. Dang. Boop. And then I believe what I did is... Uh, Mixed a little bit of my shadow color into my orange just to knock it down a little bit more. I don't want it to be very bright orange. It, adding adding a very bright orange shadow to my NMM gold would make it shift really weird and probably would make it look like a totally different color, not gold. So I love the color that uh, magenta and brown liner makes. It makes kind of this funky purple, like kind of bruise color. I love it. I love bruise color. And so I'm going to add a little bit of this to my orange to knock it down just a tad. Now I can work with it. And I'm going to add a drop of lantern yellow to my yellow. 
Oh, good morning. Good morning, Kingston. Saludos? Is that... I do not speak Spanish. Ah! Ting. I speak un peu de français. That's it. That's like leftover from like college and high school classes. So that was a long time ago. I have thought about repicking up my French at some point, but... All right. There we go. And then we've got our white. Oh, no. No resubscribe till tomorrow. Good morning, Angelo. It's good to see you. All right. We're kind of genie today. And I'm just mixing up my colors for this. It's just really weird NMM colors, I suppose. But I think that um, when you paint as many models <laughs> as some of the professionals do, eventually you get really bored with the, your standard NMM recipes and you start mixing it up and really, really mixing up and messing it up. <laughs> All right. I may add a little more, lem little more lantern to that, too. I think I might need a little more yellow. A little more yellow. So one more drop of lantern into my NMM gold highlight. A tiny bit. Un, peu, un petit peu de français. I don't, I haven't kept up with it. When you don't keep up with the language, you lose a lot of it. And I was never fluent. Alrighty. Grabbing a big brush today, I may regret this, but we'll see. I may move to tiny brush or middle brush. We shall see. Hey, so I only really got like two, three requests of if you could have Anne teach a class at ReaperCon, what would it be? Like, so like, that's it. That's it. Just like color theory and maybe limited palette color theory. And oh, wait, I've got the self-help class. That's right. Kurniko had the had the how to unjudge class. That'd be great. That's a good one. All right, going to take some of my orange in here, and I'm going to think about where my light is falling. I'm going to get a little bit of light through here. I'm probably going to get a shadow going down here. Going to blend it out a little bit. Going to do a lot of spot wet blends. When I set up NMM, I tend to do a lot of spot wet blending just to get things set the way that I think they should be. And... Uh, Although we did the kind of individual thing on this on these sections, and I'm going to have to work with them to make them uh, look a little bit more real. The other way and the better way to do NMM is to paint it as if it's cloth first and then to pick out your details. So I want to add in my shadow. Ooh, that's dark. That's because I didn't thin it enough. But I can add some water on the model and try to smoosh it. I may fail. This is fraught with peril. I feel like living dangerously today. It's Cinco de Mayo. Why not? Not quite as dangerously as Nomad Zeke. Who hopefully is, you know, not going to get, like, punished by his office for um, feeding them alcoholic uh, cupcakes. Was it alcoholic cupcakes? I mean, they may thank you. I guess it depends if the boss is invited. Hello. Faces of the mind. Yeah, like that. Faces. Hi, faces. We are okay. It's an okay day. I decided it's a good day, so we're just going to move forward with it being a good day. I'm going to actually fill in some of these little rings just to get a... not to lose the details... Playing around. NMM tends to look like a mess when you start it. I'm not a fan of the little fish scales. Um, I wish there was a finer texture to like do this with, but I have fish scales, and so fish scales is what I'm going to have to deal with. And, uh, I mean, they're probably meant to look like gold coins. I mean, as far as the design thing went, I'd have to have Izzy in front of me. This is, this is based on um, concept art by uh, Izzy Collier who is Reaper's long, long, long time, like had been with Reaper longer than I have. And I've been with them 18 years. Um, long, long, long time staff artist. So 
So we're pretty much like putting a shadow in here. And the reason the shadow is linear is because even though there's like a tiny bit of this armor, it's still a cylinder. It's wrapping around her torso, which is a cylinder. So I want some light falling down on the front of it and I want a shadow right behind it. And then I want some reflection, reflected light popping on the back. Um, and that's just standard, like how a cylinder acts. And you can see it just like on the ferrule when I'm like showing you this, you can see a highlight and then there's, you know, an under reflection down here and another highlight up top. So if you looked all around this cylinder, you'd see like kind of almost four high highlight points. So you can think about how you want to kind of fudge that as you uh, uh, try to paint, you know, little bits of armor like this realistically. This is annoying just because it's small, such a small section and it's more straight up and down, but it has just enough curve to it. So I had to decide how I was going to paint it and uh, and how it would like reflect light. I'm going to use this uh, brown liner and magenta bit to line around it a little bit, separate the armor from the hair, which is definitely gaseous. Getting over it that that it looks bad when you start thing. That would be the unjudged class. See, like here, it looks bad when you start. Getting past the ugly phase, right? Right? Getting because I have to what I what I have to do today, Chad, is I have to submit my classes for ReaperCons. So I'm trying to uh, essentially find out from people like, hey, what would you like to to have taught? Because I'm open at this point. I'm redesigning all my classes this year. So I'm starting from square zero and making new outlines and then, you know, kind of getting everything redone um, because I had been, I don't know, I felt like I'd, I'd changed the way I was doing things, getting past ugly phase. There we go. Getting past the ugly phase. And sometimes it's very hard to get past the ugly phase, right? But yeah, so I, since I have to like submit classes and since I'm creating new ones, I, uh, I was curious as to what the chat would like, what class would really benefit you right now. Yeah, the ugly duckling phase. Yeah, it comes up in so many places. It comes up in writing also, as those of you who know, I also write. Um, you know, in writing, you I mean, you have the you have the what they call the crappy first draft and then you've got to fight with that first draft. And a lot of people seem to have like this idea that if their first draft is like total crap, they they're doing it wrong when actually they're doing it right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, getting past that phase, it's any any creative form, I think. And I count coding and stuff like that as as a creative form, having uh, dating a, a, a coding coding type creative type guy. All right, so yeah, I'm gonna just bring a little bit of light back here and I'm gonna mostly try to concentrate on this area, but I want that shadow in the middle. I think I wanna darken it down just a wee bit. Here, actually I need to get back in focus. The only problem with fixing focus on one point is that then when I put the model down, it's blurry. Um, Varl, I doubt we're gonna do everything virtual. I think what we're going to, I don't know, I mean, ask John. John, what I heard, John, was that we were going to do some classes virtually and so have some virtual content, but not every class will be both in-person and virtual. That's kind of what I heard. I don't know. Oh, yeah, coding is intensely creative. I've, I've dated too many IT guys, Sean. <laughs> uh, and I did a little bit, like, I took a programming course in college, too, so I understand... Um, like how very individualistic it can be. Like people don't get that. Like, uh, my dog club, we have a, we have a custom, um, registry database and the people who originally started coding it for us then got, you know, reassigned to like other parts of the world. And so they couldn't work on our project anymore. They just, you know, their real job took over. And then my board is like, well, we'll just hire another programmer to come in and, you know, take up where they left off. And, and me and one other person on the board are like, it's honestly going to be easier if we just have them redesign something from scratch. <laughs> because once you put your, it's like you put your thumbprint on something when you code it. It's like the way that you tackle things is individualistic, right? And it's the same with painting. The way that I tackle NMM is different from the way that David tackles NMM to, you know, Ser Sergio tackling NMM, Luca tackling NMM, you know, it's all these different approaches and they all end up, you know, giving you the effect you want, but it's different roads to get there. Yes, there will be some virtual content. Good deal. Yeah, 
Yeah, Krios, it's you've gotta still keep your voice, right? Still keep it. I mean, because you can have there's power. It's really hard for writers to spot what it, what is really like power and what's just their favorite thing, but doesn't really help the story. I'm um. I enjoy editing. I might be the weirdo writer who enjoys editing. I mean, there are times I get sick of it, but most of the time I just get excited about like you know making my story a little bit better. I'm at the point now where I'm not doing like a lot though, just a tiny tiny bit. Trying to fix certain things. It's just like painting. Like it, I as a painter and a writer, these creative disciplines are so close to each other, and so I have to think like from from comments or discussions I've had with um, other creatives, like Amanda from Reaper, who did uh, quilting, high, pretty high level quilting. You know, it's the same sort of thing, where you know, concept to execution, the ugly phase to you know, correction to you know, and some. Some things you correct a lot earlier, right? If you're doing metalworking, you probably have to deal with fundamental problems early because once you get it in a solid state, you're, you know, you're less likely going to scrap the whole thing and start over is kind of your adjustment period for some of that. But, um, but I think in almost all creative pursuits, you run into these areas and how will you deal with them? Like how well you can get by them? It's, it's a real challenge, right? Hello, Mukao. Nice. Glad you're, you're going to get a Reaper package or a different package. Yeah, writing software is a great blend of it. So is um, so is like just writing though, Declearman, because you use your creative brain when you're doing your rough draft, but then everything after that, like unless you're like unless you've wiped out some soul of your writing and you have to go back with kind of you know your gut, like um, Krios was just saying. Uh, but so much of your editing process then as a writer is is pure like then you let the ener the editor out of the cage and you have to try to make it better all right so what i'm doing here is i'm essentially accentuating my shadows i'm trying to uh, pick up some of these details out here so it's a different different way than i did up here um i'll probably go back and kind of apply this a bit but uh we're just trying to get a, a nice mix here of being able to see the details, to show the highlights, to imply that shadow that's falling right under her arm. That's that dark spot right there. Um, and still pick up some light on the edges of these little coins from the appropriate direction. Oh, good. Yay, starter paint set. Good, good, good. Yeah, and then technical writing, right? Because you have to use some creativity to explain things and try to empathize with your reader, right? You always have to be conscious of your reader. You should do that in fic as a fiction writer, too, of course, but. Yeah, it's all creativity. Is so, so wonky, really. <laughs> and and you and if you want to be a really good creative, then, yeah, you do need both sides of the brain. You're right, you guys. Because there's like there's there's the creative that just wants to do the play part where you just spew everything out and then you're happy. And then there's the creative that's like, you know, this is cool and all, but it could be better. And that's where you get into trouble. <laughs> all right. So I think I'm pretty happy with this a little. I'm just kind of like bringing, bringing the light in pretty hard on this side because that's the front of the model. We're going to see it. Um, but we still want to imply that shadow under the arm. We can tell that we put our shadow in the right place, by the way, because as I shift it under this light source, that shadow from her arm falls right onto that area that I made dark. So I know that I did it right. If you ever see like a shadow from your light source falling onto a highlighted area and you're aiming it the correct direction, i.e. this is the way your light is meant to fall, then you know that maybe you should adjust something if you want a more realistic uh, lighting. So I'm going to just bring in, I'm going to leave that little bit of highlight back here. I'm going to actually put, bring in a little more orange here because her hair is white. And so there would be some reflected light picking up these guys is what I'm thinking. Yes, everybody wants a Sophie bust. Yes. Hopefully Ron is listening. If you keep raving about it, it'll happen one way or another. Like eventually Izzy will hear of it and hopefully there will be art. And I'm just going to bring in a little bit of light here and here. 
and down there. That's a little bit. That's better. Little touches. All right, let's get these. And these are more cylinders. The bracelets are more cylinders, but they're pretty easy because they're mostly facing front. So you know the light's going to be coming straight down, so you start shading off to the sides. And you, you aren't seeing, because her arm is tucked into her hair and her body, you aren't seeing um, the full cylinder. You're only seeing, like, one side of the cylinder, just like over here. But over here, I wanted to put a shadow in the middle of two highlights, and here I want to put a highlight in the middle of two shadows. And that's somewhat a stylistic choice. It's the easy choice for these bracelets. Um, it's the logical choice as well, because what you've got here is you've got a shadow falling down the middle because of the arm. You know that, right? So and since you have to alternate, you know that then you're going to go light on either side. Whereas here, you've got light falling straight down the front, so you know you're going to have your highlight there, which means you automatically have shadows on either side. It did work for getting a pirate ship. Yes. That's true. Reaper's starting a precedent here. But then Ron Ron was uh, complaining that he was running out of ideas and needed ideas anyway. So you can... Uh... He, he seems to do that. And then he turns around and says, no, I have too many ideas. Ah. <laughs> I just hope Christine Van Patten um, remembers my idea that Ron had her working up some concepts for. I hope it gets made next, Bones. There's a concept I've been... There's a thing I've been wanting, guys. There's a thing I've been wanting for a while. I keep bringing it up. And until we started doing stuff in Bones, it was impossible. Because you could never have done it at a, at a decent price point. Um... But I would like a life-size fairy dragon. A fairy dragon that's the size of like a kitten. In bones. That's what I want. Um, so. Uh, real hair looks out of scale. Uh, weirdly. I mean, you could. I mean, like, although she's a little small for it. I mean, if you had a Barbie scale model or a bust, you could probably do it. I mean, people do it on dolls, right? Um. But it would look a little odd, Mukau, because this is just like it looks a little weird on Barbie. Um, it looks to me, it looks odd because everything else is painted. And then you've got this real thing sitting there reflecting light completely differently. Um, you know, you have no control over the highlights and shadows on it. Uh, so, I mean, I could see a limited usage if you wanted to try it. Certainly, I mean, you could always you could do like spray paint over the top of it, like hairsprays and followed by some airbrushing. That would be interesting. Um, but remember also, then you won't be able to paint like individual strands. You'll have to work really hard to keep it from globbing up into like crazy streaks and stuff. It would be hard to work with. Yeah, it would be very hard to work with. I could only see it on a bust Shadow Raven because... Um, a bust would be Barbie size. And, it, you know, they put it on Barbies and other dolls of that scale. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we got at least our first shadow. See how see how putting that orange in makes it, these look a little bit more rounded already? And I want to work a little bit more mixture of orange and yellow in there. Get a little bit more of a gradient. And we're going to bring in our purple and put that at the very outer edge. Really darken that down. Give it more dimension. There are some things, there, there are ways to do the wings. I mean, it, you, you pretty much have to like find some material that you can put over a wire armature. But yeah, I would love a life-size fairy dragon. I've been asking for it for a couple of Kickstarters. And Ron finally, when he was like trying to come up with more like big, interesting models, he finally kind of asked um, Christina to do some concept art. But I don't know if it'll go. I don't know if it'll be a thing or not. It would be really cool if it was, though. Because it, be, it would be a real scale fairy dragon, right? Because instead of having these miniatures of huge dragons, we would have this, you know, one-to-one -one scale baby fairy dragon. And it would be so cool. Anyway, that was, that's just my wish. 
I would totally have it as a desk mascot, a painting desk mascot. I'm going to put pure white right down the middle. See how that pops that out? Now, if I wanted, really, if this was meant to be mirror bright, like really, really, really shiny, it was Ron's choice to ask Christine to do it, actually, Shadow Raven. So Ron is awesome. It's the only time you're going to hear me say that on stream. <laughs> oh. But, um, so, okay. So if I decided I wanted these bracelets to be like really mirror bright, then I, my high, then my shadows are in the wrong place because the closer you move in your darks to your lights, the brighter and shinier, um, it looks. So if you're looking for like more of a chrome, like a highly, highly polished gold, um, gold here, then you want to put your shadows like right up next to the white and, uh, and go out to the sides more like I did up here. But I'm pretty happy with just those straight up. So at this point, I mostly want to get this model done because I have some awesome models waiting in the wings to paint. And it's like we've been working. I started this model years ago because um, I did the skin because I felt like doing smooth skin tones. And I wanted to do a gradient that was blue to pink. Um, there we go. I like that. All right. So. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to add in a bit of shadow down here because her leg is turning. So we actually do need a bit more. I'm going to tune my NMM here now. So adding in a bit more of a dramatic shadow here. I've thinned my paints so that you, what I'm doing really is just like kind of putting a heavy glaze over that area, just painting it on. Um, as I get later in the painting process, I tend to do that a lot. Do like little spot glazes and quick layers and... Um, all that sort of thing. So the later I not the later I am in a project, the thinner my paint gets. In a weird kind of way. So yeah, since this leg is lifting up, the there's actually a crease in the um, little bits here. So I'm gonna knock in this shadow and then I'm gonna refine it and build and. Uh, you know, pick out these coins again a little bit, but not nearly as much and in line with like kind of where the light is going to be hitting. So on this side of the coin, I don't have a real strong light source on this model because that wasn't kind of my point when I started it. I more wanted to do the kind of ethereal dawn colored, um, you know, genie. That's more my, my concept. And there are painters that always start with a strong, strong light signature. And I think their work is awesome. I mean, Luca is one of them. Um, I love it. It's like, but that's something I have to actually work at. Like when I start often, I'll start with a color concept instead of kind of a lighting concept. And I'll have to like figure out or tune my lighting after a while. So like with color combos, I feel like I, it's effortless for me, but with, uh, with the light, I often don't start with a really strong light signature. I really enjoy it when I do it. And so I'm trying to do it more. Let me just pick out these little guys. Then we'll retain our shadow that we've put in there. But we've also brought in a little bit more drama. I need to bring in a very bold white here. 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 I just want to add some some real white areas to that. Thank you, Timos. She's getting there. I mean, we, we have her entire back still, but that should be pretty um, effortless. So this is, since these are rising up toward the light, I'm going to pop the highlight on this outer, these outer scales quite a bit. I lost a little bit of my highlight on the inside of the eyes here, these little plates. So I'm going to come in there. We also haven't done the little eyes on the owl, on the owls. So if I'm going to make them a contrasting color, I need to do that soon. <laughs> Just looking. Okay, not mixing it. Not missing anything. Making sure that I'm not missing any questions in chat. 
It is time to do our stretch break in just a second. A very, very short stretch break. And I need to come in where I did here and do this little bangle on this side, which is really only just base coated. Yeah, there's a lot of little bits. Got to do my little fringe down here. There's a lot of little gold bits that need attention on this model. And some of it will just be like really kind of shorthand. Like it won't be a lot of work. Because the tinier the surface, the more you have to kind of generalize NMM. The more you can kind of, dare I say, half-ass it, and uh, still it looks fine. Because really small surfaces, really then you go kind of stylistic. And you don't have enough room to do realism, so you just want to hit your basic, hit your basics of NMM. That's looking a lot better. I like that. It's white um, right now, Goroff. I wanted to make it white like clouds because I did like all this kaleidoscope of color with her it coming out of the lamp down here where we went for purple and a little bit of green and yellow and orange and pink. Um, and I really like that. That like goes with my dawn colors idea for this figure. But I wanted the hair to be more like a cloud. So I was thinking I was going to go white with it. Um, which is why I kind of started like putting in little striations up here. Uh, I didn't want to go black, which would, be, would have been really the other option. I didn't want to go golden because er there's so much gold on her already. I didn't want to go um, black because it would have been very heavy. Since she's really ethereal, she's really coming to life from clouds. And her hair looks like a cloud or mist. Um, I didn't want to go black because that would have been, a, well, it would have given it a heavy weight. And as it is, this is like kind of the tightest portion of her that looks like it's the most physical. Um, so I wanted to stick with the ethereal. I was thinking about like doing some, I like kind of how this medium gray like adds some depth, kind of like I added darker blues down here to give the swirls some depth. So I am thinking of bringing in my grays a little stronger up here. Probably I'll go with a blue gray though. Uh, be just because I don't want to go like true neutral with it. We'll see. We'll see. There's a little bit of blue in parts of her hair as it is, but I don't necessarily want the hair to look like this either. I kind of want it to be different. So I think white, silver, silver hair. That's where I, that's where I was going before. It's kind of where I'm still going. But if I decide, if I get around to the back of the model and I decide that's too boring, I may throw some colors into it. I mean, it's never, it's never a full commit. You can always repaint if you don't like it. Uh, Mukau, you want to, if you're using Master Series paint, um, and shake well, shake well before you use them. If you squeeze them out into a palette or onto a wet palette and you notice there's some clear fluid, stop, <laughs> reshake your paint <laughs> and squeeze it out until you get nice solid color. It should never be watery when you put, when you squeeze it out of the, the nozzle. If you, if it is, then you need to just shake it a little more. Um, you shouldn't have to shake it like enough that your arm falls off. It's actually a pretty fluid paint. So it goes into solution pretty easily, but some colors take a little bit more than others like yellows, yellows and blues, um, can take a little more shaking. Uh, I recommend many, many brushes. <laughs> um, again, I'd worry about getting a bit, I, I don't want to get too heavy. I really want to stay like cloudy and misty growth. Certainly you could. I mean, it, it's the obvious choice if you want to add high contrast up here. Um, I was banking on the, the darkest thing I really wanted to add to her was the bodysuit. Um, I was trying to keep away specifically from dark colors on this model, even though normally I say always alternate light and dark, light and dark, light and dark for high contrast. And yes, it would bring more attention to her face. Um, you could probably do a fade on it. I'm not sure I want to. Just because I, uh, my concept of this model with silver hair is like one of the earliest concepts that I got for that. So I tend to stick. If, if I feel like I've got a very strong gut feeling of how I want to paint a figure, I tend to stick to that unless I really see I've got a problem. Like if I really felt at this point, like if I do the hair in white and I will bring in some darker gray shadows around the face. Like I said, I'm, I like the dark gray shadow back here and I probably will bring it up. Um, but if... 
if I still feel like the face doesn't get enough emphasis after I put that dark gray shadow in here, like, then I'm not sure that black is going to be the answer either. So, but yeah, you could totally do a fade like that. It would work really well on this model because she actually looks like she's got real hair, like right up here in the front with the part and everything. But then it very quickly just goes to swirls. So yeah, that would be a doable thing. I would probably establish it with a wet blend if you did that. Um, any any silver hair colors work. Usually you want to start with kind of a blue blue gray um, trouble, but uh, purple gray can work. If you're doing like jungle mist, kind of like if you were doing a um, some sort of mist misty spirit in like a jungle setting, which you totally could actually paint her as a jungle genie. That would be pretty cool. Then you could use uh, tones of green in your gray. I mean, it's un it's uh, using just a neutral gray tends to be actually kind of a bad idea when you're doing silver. You it, Sergio teaches this too. Um, that you always want to have a little bit of another color in your silver because it white or silver reflects so many colors from the surrounding environment that you almost always have hints of something. So, so really I start with a medium dark gray and then I work out from there. <laughs> Probably not, Mukau. Probably not. So I'll talk about brushes. I'll do take my uh, my quick break, quick stretch break, everybody, so that we can have you know stay limber because we all sit at these desks all day, right? Here, let me zoom in. There we go. Got in focus, so we can all stare at the genie while we do our stretch break. There we go. Now you can see the smoke. Um, if you've been sitting for more than forty five minutes, please, please, please get up and stretch. It is a good thing for yourself. I had to do this because my back went out a couple months ago and I got serious finally about stretching and uh, getting up early and doing some core exercises in the morning and it has made a huge difference. But even just stretching, please stretch. Hey, there you go. See what's magic, Mukau. Magic. Do a stretch above your head, lean back. Okay, do a back bend. It really helps. And if you hear your back crack, you're doing it right. <laughs> Sometimes in the morning when I raise my arms over my head, I can just feel my shoulders crack. Like they, after, a, after a night curled into a C shape in bed, I'm like actually learning how my spine goes the other way. Behind the back stretches. Do your ergonomics, everybody. Hey, I think it's going to be another hot day here, guys. I've got the window open, but... It is getting, I guess, under my giant light of doom, I, I do get a little warm in here. All right, and I'm going to do my couple of floor exercises. It's just going to take a minute, and then we will resume. Oh, no, Wolf is overboard. This is the problem with assembling models and placing them where I can just, you know, brush by them. I've got the Limbo Wolf Rider that I put together the other day and, uh, and started, started the putty on. So Wolfie is, uh, here, here, here. Let's share Wolfie. Here, Jeannie, out of the way. Wolfie's come along. Lots of green stuff, but pretty cool. So there. But unfortunately, my choice to put Wolfie um, is very knockoverable, so I probably should fix that. Stay, sit, stay Wolfie. The problem is I want her to be around so that I can remember she's there. Be right back. Stretches. Alrighty, we are back. Boing. Sweet. So awesome. Oh, and since I'm in the middle of the stream and 
at a break, I'd like to plug my Patreon. I do have a Patreon. It is patreon.com slash painting big. I just put up a uh, special offer PDF. So if you sign on for a month at the $10 tier, you get all of like two years of $10, $5, and $2 content. Plus you get a special PDF on uh, Sky Earth NMM that I was working on on this model. It's like a 13 page PDF and it took me forever to write. So that is my plug for my Patreon, patreon.com slash painting big. I do a lot with, um, if you're into master series paint, I do a lot of color stuff too in the $5 tier um, of that particular Patreon. Thank you for the link, Quindy and Chibi. But that is, that is my, uh, my dealio. I love my Patreon. It is the most funnest thing that I do. Funnest is a word. Dr. Seuss says so. All right, let's uh, let's work on this one now because really, it's really static and it is kind of flat on her torso, so it's okay. But I still feel like I could bring down a little bit more shadow, and you can see how thin my orange is, right? It barely colors the uh, surface. Ah, Kundi spelled it right. <laughs> That's the thing, right? The Patreon's been going, uh, once it's been going for like over two years, like there's so much value for like 10 bucks. Um, and then the $15, the paint along, but, but yeah, so I'm glad you guys enjoy it. It really does make me happy. I love making, making new things for it. All right. So I brought in a little bit of shadow here. I'm still going to have a tiny bit of highlight here on the outside edge because they've you're going to get some reflected light from around her, but I want a pretty strong highlight down the middle. So I'm actually going to take down my shadows a little bit here by just painting over them, making more of a strong central highlight surrounded by some shadow. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about painting a textured area like it's cloth, like paint right over the texture. Like just don't worry about the texture at first. Figure out what your shadows and highlights should be should be like. Thank you. Thank you everybody who is already a patron. You guys literally keep me going. Like you keep me in groceries. So totally all the love cuz groceries cuz food. <laughs> You fuel my Indian cooking habit. There. So a little bit more of a bright highlight down the middle here. Still not working quite with pure white, more of a, a mixture. And since there's such small areas here, it's hard to do like a very, very uh, defined. Like your highlights and shadows have to be kind of smushed together a bit. You don't have a lot of room to work with here. Usually this just means I have to do a bit more futzing to get it to the point that I like it. <laughs> I am totally a foodie, yeah. Totally a foodie. Yeah, I made, um, I made, it turns out that Indian uh, food does have a sweet and sour. Um, so last night I made it. It's, uh, it's an apricot. It's a chicken with dried apricots. So it's a, it's a curry, but it also has dried apricots and, um, dried cane sugar, which is, they call it jaggery, which I actually have because I ordered it from India cause foodie. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I made it kind of a, it's a, it was a sweet and sour Indian curried chicken. It was actually really good. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your endorsement of my Patreon. You make me feel loved. I keep it going for you. Like, and me. I mean, I, I enjoy it, yes. But whenever somebody says they get a lot of value out of my teaching here or wherever, that makes me happy. That's what, that's what keeps me in. Just keeping on my adjustment, just making sure I've got a highlight coming down the side here, making sure I've got this central highlight coming out. I really feel like I've gotten a little bit too dark right under that owl head or a different color. I feel like I've got just brown liner there and I want to add my purple instead. Just 
<laughs> oh, nice. Apricot chicken. Apricot curry chicken. Yeah, tasty. And, like, um, the recipe in my book actually adds, like, uh, crispy potato fries, like shoestring potatoes on top of it to give it texture. We didn't have it, uh, any potatoes last night, so we used, um, I used plantain chips and crumbled them, and David used corn chips and crumbled them, and it was, it was good. So having the crunchy on top of it, just the salty crunchy is just really the bonus. But yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, I loved sweet and sour as a kid, but it's way too sweet for me now. And this is just like a little sweet. And so it's really good. I don't know, in a restaurant, they might really sweet it up because of American people, uh, what they think sweet and sour is, which is more sweet. <laughs> but making it homemade was, uh, was really good. We'll make again. David was like, this is a really good one. <laughs> Autocorrect is, is, autocorrect is so annoying. <laughs> I should do a once a month Indian cooking class. I am not an expert. Like, I learned everything I know I've learned from, like, three very good cookbooks. Like, there's, there's what I would call my entry level cookbook, Indian cookbook, and then, like, then I got hardcore. <laughs> and then other cookbooks that gave me a little bit of information on, like, um, cooking spices and for how long. But once I got into the authentic ingredients, that was, it was over, man. I was like, I have so many spices. But next up, next up is, uh, cause that was, that was like the last recipe from this one book that I really wanted to try. So now it's into the Thai and uh, Malaysian cooking. Which hopefully I won't need to buy a whole bunch of new ingredients for. I think it should be, like, I should have everything for that. Because it's not, like, Indian food is, like, the insane, like, Olympics of food. It's, like, you need so many different ingredients because they put so many spices into their recipes. And I've gotten to where I enjoy that and I'm used to it. So now when I make, like, a normal, quote-unquote, normal recipe and there's only, like, seven ingredients, I'm like, where are the rest of the ingredients? Yeah, I loved, actually, I loved Thai a lot better than Indian um, in my early days, uh, but I've gotten to really, to really appreciate Indian curries. Now that I understand, like, the flavors that go into them, and I understand, like, I get the complexity of them, I really, really enjoy Indian. So really, really tiny little highlights on these tiny places right by the eye. Those little tiny highlights are going to help bring out everything in there. I did kind of blurf on one of them, so I'm going to fix it. Kind of blurfed over the line on that one. But that brings out the shape of the face. Like, don't skimp on these tiny highlights next to these eyeballs because it does bring out the shape of the face. It is important. I'm going to actually bring up, mix up just some standard brown liner, though, I think. Just because I want a dark line. The smaller the detail, the darker the line to bring out the detail. So the purple is dark, but I think I need something that's even darker. So we'll get our brown liner out, 9064, and correct to that problem. But yeah, it's like um, he's got the, it's the same person who did my favorite Indian cookbook has a. Uh, a Far East, one that's uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam. So that, I haven't even let myself crack it open because if it is going to make me order all sorts of new things off of Amazon, I, I want to space out my buying. My, uh, my habit is uh, a bit much at this point. All right, so... Got those eyes back. I'm going to actually come in here and line around these little eyeballs. We'll probably go magenta with these eyeballs, although I am debating making them more of a blue because I've got the purple, the red purple on both sides. So I don't know if I need more red purple. I kind of want almost like a medium blue, kind of like my shadow for this. I don't know. Still thinking about it. The gold's looking a lot better now. Yeah, liners, they're good. 
Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it, Omidar? Like once you get used to that palette of flavors and the complexity of it, it's it's a it's a hard habit to break. And I like like we started out just ordering. There are a couple of really good Indian places like right down the street from us, so we were ordering from there, and that's what got me kind of addicted. And then I was like, I'm gonna learn to cook this stuff because there's tons of Indian grocery stores around here, and uh, that that was that was the start of the end, the beginning of the end. All right, so I'm just going to paint some of my orange like over some of these little gold areas. And then come back in to highlight because like, it's hard to get to some of these guys. The shoulder up here is like a face, but it's buried under a lot of her hair. So I got to kind of be careful in here. But... Covering it with the orange, I mean, since the orange is my shadow and I can just highlight the yellow over the top of it, it's not a bad, not a bad proposition to give it some depth. Need to also um, bring some of this in on these other parts of her belt. She has more little gold bits than you, than you at first realize. I'm just going to get this over the top. Pretty much just going to kind of shade and use my orange on all of the remaining gold parts, including my little flower up here. The only sad thing about starting Thai cooking is that my Thai basil is still tiny. It is definitely not to the edible point yet. I'm so used to using an... an uh, a hydroponic garden for basil and it grows so fast in hydroponic and now I'm using just a regular little starter pod and it's taking forever. I'm like, I can't eat you yet. Grow faster. All right. And we want to get this one just to give it a bit of shadow. We want to get this one. There. All right. And we have now like darkened down like all of our remaining gold. So now we can work it. So, all right. We may have one more day of working on the NMM gold, but I'll, I'll spread it out. We'll do the back of the model first and then we'll come back to the last touch-ups. NMM just takes a while. Like when I did the, um, oh, was it Logan Grimnar? Yeah. The Space Wolf uh, Patriarch guy, or Lehman Ross, when I did Lehman Ross, like that model took me about 45 hours, I think, in total, and like 25 of it was the NMM. <laughs> it's just, just to show you, like that's why, so it's not unusual that the NMM portions of a model um, take you more time than everything else, because there's just more to them in some ways, especially when it's intricate stuff like this, where you've got these little designs. Um, I'm going to also paint orange over our little lamp down here. And some yellow. Just going to try to block in just a bit of shadow on it so it's not just sitting there pale yellow anymore. It's got some dimension. The model faces or the owl faces? It's mostly thin paint and a very, very good brush token. So, like, my brushes that I use, and actually you asked this, Moo, um, but I use really good sable brushes. You can use synthetics, but you're going to burn through them pretty fast, especially if you do a lot of painting. And they also don't quite give you the same tip that these guys do. So, my Kalinske sables, is this, this is the size, like, gamut that I use. And uh, just to put it next to her so you can kind of see. So this is Teensy Brush. It's like a 3 aught. It's equivalent to about a 2 aught in the Windsor Newton, Newton Series 7, so a double zero. Um, this one is a 1, but this one is this one is also a 1. They're just two different brands, and so the size varies. Um, but usually, like, some people use a size 2 brush from some brands, but more often you'll see people using brush sizes around 0 or 1 or double zero. 
or um, zero slash five. The Reaper, the small Reaper brushes that I think are the most useful are zero slash five and the zero slash ten from their Kalinsky Sable line. Kalinsky is the type of hair. And a Kalinsky Sable brush will say Kalinsky on it almost always. And what Kalinsky is, it's just the top two grades of Red Sable. Like the top two best grades. There's like 10 or 15 different grades of Red Sable. And, you know, from the craptastic Red Sable brush that you can pick up for a buck to the the Kalinskis, which will run you usually between $10 and $20 a piece, depending on if they're grade one or grade two and what company you're getting them from. Also, uh, the size will vary the price. Model face, yeah. Yeah, so these brushes, they have such sharp points. Like, you can see how tiny those tips are. And then when you're using thinner paint, I use a well palette so that I can control my consistency. So when you're using paint that's got water in it, a lot of water in it, you can essentially get, like, really, really tiny. Like, that one's wide. But you can get really tiny little lines and stripes. Like, really, really tiny and little dots, like you can do all your details. And this is possible not just because the brush has a really fine tip, like look at those tiny little dots that I just did, um, but also because you're thinning your paint. So when you get a like really fine brush like this, you need to thin your paint to be able to, for the paint to stay wet in it so that it comes off in these little, stro little strokes. So thinning your paint and, and a good brush are the two key, two key components to doing really good faces because you need to be able to hit the fine details. Yeah, no problem. The other key thing, um, token, um, is, uh, unloading your brush. So when you dip your brush in the paint, don't just, you know, put it on the model, spend some time kind of dabbing it on the side and unloading it. You want to be able to see the tip of the brush and to be able to see that it's really fine. And you want the, the paint at most to go out halfway up the brush. You don't want to dip the whole brush in. So I usually only load up about a quarter to a third of it. And then after I've dabbed it off, the paint will come up to maybe half or two thirds mark on the brush. And that's what I use. Yep. 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 I'm going to, I'm actually in the middle of doing a YouTube city uh, series, just all about this um, with new tips just for new painters. And so hopefully I need to get to, I need to get to the next one of those. I'm trying to do them every Friday. I just started though. All right, let's see here. And then the Reaper YouTube is another excellent resource. Um, I have a paint, uh, an article, a class on there from last ReaperCon called uh, Thinning MSP Paints. And it talks about how much to thin the paint for various different techniques when you're using um, MSP, Reaper MSP. Uh, and that, Actually, if you go to my Patreon, I have a free PDF that goes along with that. But you can just watch the class on the Reaper YouTube. If you look for thinning MSP paints, it should come right up. And uh, that can be very helpful as well if you're just starting out. But yeah, in general, um, plastic or Taclon brushes, which are usually the orange bristled or white bristled ones that you see in the stores, they're plastic bristles. So they're going to deform and bend over time. But they're like pretty good for when you're starting. But once you take decent care of your brushes, do consider buying an expensive one for detail work. Because it's going to allow you to uh, perform generally at a higher level. Brushes are really important and every painter has their own favorite. I like the brands of Da Vinci and um, Raphael. Those are my two favorites. A lot of people like Windsor and Newton Series 7. A lot of people like Rosemary. Um, I think Luca likes uh, the Russian manufacturer that Kirill uses. That would be uh, Ruloff, right? Rufloff? Rubloff. That's it. R-O-U-B-L-O-F-F. -F. And then Reaper also does a very affordably priced um, Kalinsky sable. It's the black handled brushes on the Reaper site. And those I used all the time when I was a staff painter at Reaper. Um, and I, I mostly used the, uh, zero slash five and the zero slash 10. So that, those are only about 10 bucks. And so they're, uh, they're a nice entry level. If you want to try a good quality brush or a sable brush and see how it works, how it acts, um, Reaper gives you a pretty good way to get in. Thank you for the link, Quindy. Yeah, but I talk a lot about about thinning and how much to thin to get good results and stuff like that with various techniques. 
And that's a forever, that'll be forever up on YouTube because uh, that's what when we did the ReaperCon online. That was the dealio. And I wanted that class to be up because I just think it's so useful. And that way you guys can watch it at any time. Like, it, that information is never going to get old, because it's physics. <laughs> like, it may vary. Um, like, other paint lines, you're probably going to need to thin more, because many of them have a have a thicker base. But you could still, like, use that kind of the ballpark, just, like, how things should look for each different technique would still be useful. Just... Dealing with stuff here now and uh, adding in some little, I'm doing some some little adjustments, shading, highlighting. I wanted to hit the top of the bird's face here. I want to hit these. Like I said, we probably got like one more day of NMM, but I'll, I'll probably do the back of the model instead so that we don't have to sit and stare at Genie NMM like every week. I'm doing a little bit of a white highlight in the middle here. Again, because we want to... Um, imply that light is falling straight down. We want to kind of blend in this little shadow here. When you get on really small areas though, you don't have to worry about blending very much. You just need to make it look correct. Um, the smaller the area, the less you'll be able to blend because you're working with such tiny, tiny little details. So don't put yourself like through crazy, crazy land thinking that you have to somehow blend tiny little jewelry bits. You really don't. You just need to hit your highlight and your shadow and your reflection and you're good. Oh yeah, Pokey Tool. Pokey Tool to save the day. The Reaper Pokey Tool. Also, you can use a pin, safety pin. Um, I sometimes use my pin vise if I'm really impatient, which is a bad habit because then you have to clean the paint out of the grooves in your drill bit. Uh, but I've been known to do it. So, but yeah, the Pokey Tool is fun. And cool. It's big enough that it doesn't easily get lost. Um, you can stick it into corkboard if you want to just keep it close to your your area. Um, and it's got you know having the skull on there is a comfortable holder, unlike just using a straight pin. So yeah, pokey tool. It's essentially gonna okay. So what this is, uh, what's usually happening when you get a clog mukau? If it's a brand new bottle, it could just be that the tiny aperture in this dropper tip wasn't fully like punched through in the manufacturing process, in which case you're just pretty much putting it all the way down and punching it right in there. Um, the other thing that can happen is you could have a glob of latexing paint, like just paint that's like dried a tiny bit that's blocking that aperture. Um, in which case you're trying to essentially push that glob out of there so that you can then, you know, shake and, you know, get it away from, from your aperture. It, it isn't like real common to have a, a like dried chunks of paint in your MSP bottles. Cause they obviously they don't expose much area to the air, but it does happen that stuff will skin over just a tad. And in that case, you want that dried paint pushed away from that aperture because the aperture is so small. So even a tiny particle can can clog. So that's why you poke, the, and it also widens out the aperture just a tiny bit because you're putting this big pin down in there. So it also allows the paint to get out a lot easier. So it will not pull it out. I mean, unless you've got, if you've got a dried plug of paint up here, sometimes I can push the tip in and kind of pull it out, but I'll normally like kind of play with it, like just try to scrape. If there's a plug of dried paint up here, I'll kind of like scrape it out, like use doing that. The other thing you can do if you have dry, dried paint in here though, is you can just pop off the, the nipple here. I'm not gonna do it because this is covered with wet paint right now. Maybe I can find a dry one. One second. Nope, that one's still fresh. Oh, come on. Can I get a nozzle that, there we go. So you can just pop this out just by pulling it to the side. And then you can take your pokey tool and you can even see the tiny aperture and just poke the pokey tool through from this side and that'll push the dried plug of paint out of there. And then just pop that back in. Yes, but whatever you do, Quindy is correct. Do not continue to squeeze if your paint bottle is blocked because uh, as you guys could see, it's not hard to get this to pop out, which means that when you build up a ton of pressure, this tip flies out of the bottle and paint sprays everywhere. Um, other paint companies have even bigger problems with this. At least click, Reapers kind of click into place. So we have a, it's a lot harder to get that to happen, but you can do it if you, pr if you press uh, enough. 
Pain explosion, yep. Yeah, if you pop the nipple top off and just come at it from the other side, you can easily make short work of a clog. It's it's not hard. Like, people complain about that, and I'm like, seriously? Because when we were using, like, paint pots, your paint would actually go bad faster. So it's like, here, you just have to deal with, like, your nipple top and, your and you know, your paint will stay good for over a decade, which doesn't happen with paint pots. Not unless you're constantly adding water and renewing, re refreshing them. Oh, thanks for the gifted sub, and thanks for the resub, Avon. Thank you for the gifted, and thank you for the uh, for the resub. That's very nice of you. Oh, it's Avon Trap. Got it. So I will call you Von Trap. Are you a singer? Gonna just put some highlights up on this little thing. Oh, yeah. No, I know you weren't complaining. I was speaking more like I have heard people complain over the years about it. And say they liked paint pots better. And I'm like, you liked it when your paint would get all gritty and go bad after, you know, just a couple years? Like, they're usually not thinking relatively. I much prefer the greater lifespan of MSP. Adding just some basic highlights in. Often I will start with NMM by just adding my highlight first, and then I'll work with shadows. Sometimes I work in. Ah, okay. I will not ask you to sing then. Don't worry. The only one who sings on the stream is me, and I only do it for subversaries. Then we sing the subversary song. You do complain about a lot of things. That's just not one of them. Well, good. <laughs> Complaining is the human natural, you know, worldwide pastime. Like, I believe that if, if every country had to come up with a, an actual national pastime that was, like, in common between all countries, complaining would be what gets the final vote. Humans love to complain. I sometimes get in this mind space as well. So lately... Lately, I've just been like, it's a good day. I just love the weather. I'm just like, I can't be unhappy when it's so beautiful out and I get to go take my walk in such gorgeous weather. When the world is like very, when the world is a very nice place to be out in. Oh, I got sunburned yesterday too. I went to the pool. I had my pool and hot tub appointment here in the complex and uh, it was glorious, but I got sunburned. You complain. Well, you live in Scotland. Like, the weather is, like, the primary complaint, probably, right? Oh. Like, every time, like, you're talking, it's like, you're like, uh, Kerniko is like, yes, it's torrentially raining again. Yes, it's a dreary day here in Scotland. Yes, we have more snow in April. You know, it's like, oh, no. Poor Scotland. I had a friend who relocated, who went to England from Germany because she started dating a guy in England and she was always down on the weather because apparently compared to Germany, England's weather is awful. Massachusetts weather was worse, yeah. It's a great place if you like rain and alcohol. <laughs> oh, Lord. I love it. There's other cool things in Scotland. You have ruined castles and crap. I love that stuff. Doing a little bit of just a little highlight, just highlighting these little bangly things. Like I mentioned, you want your highlight, your shadow, and your under reflection. You need to hit those three pillars on little things. And sometimes if they're just like little tiny things, you really only need like a shadow and a highlight. 
like these little dots up here. These little like tiny dots on either side of here. Seriously, shadow and bright white highlight and you're good. You don't have enough room to suggest a lot of other stuff. Let's see here. That's pretty cool, Valander. Compared to three continents, England's weather is awful. <laughs> I think we have like a 70 degree day today. Let's see. Oh, it's actually, well, it says it's supposed to get up to 80 today, but I don't know if I believe it. Lately, it seems to have been telling me it's going to be 80s and it only ever gets up to high 70s. So the forecasting uh, is not great on this one lately. Putting in some purple shadow, purple shadow. Hello. You're going to go back to lurking, Von Trap. You can lurk. Lurking is permissible. Pop out when you have a question. All right, highlight. And I'm gonna go and actually put in a shadow right around this, this time. And then put another highlight. What do we got? Yeah, we're about, I started a few minutes late. I was up early, but, or I was on, but Reaper, uh, the switch wasn't thrown right away. So I think we need to go an extra five minutes. So we'll just kind of get in some extra highlights. Trying to get as much of this NMM done as we can so that when we come back to do more of it, Hailstones the high the size of Hershey kisses. Wow. You know what? I don't really like that. So I'm gonna go and change it. There. Alrighty. So tomorrow is Monique Day. We're doing our Chibi Vampire. And I think we've got some more black to do. She's coming along really fast. We'll have to eventually do some NMM on her too. Because she's got her sword and we have to do the gold. I'll probably hold off on the gold since we've been doing this. We had a lot of hail in Texas. Like more hail than I than I think I've seen anywhere else that I've lived. Didn't have any when I was out on the East Coast. And then every once in a while in Wisconsin, it's in a long while. There was usually tiny hailstones. But Texas, Texas had serious hail. In fact, I think we got more hail than snow. If I put all of my years together in Texas, pretty sure that the hail versus snow ratio would be on the side of hail. There we go, like that. Oh, I mean, I'm gonna putty your butt and leave off the sword, Shadow Raven, I don't really care. I could still send it to Ron if I felt like it. I haven't decided on this one, though. Because I think Ron had uh, Rhonda doing the... Somebody else was doing the actual gallery version on this one. I'd have to check to see what's in the gallery right now, if they have a painted version. Although some stuff hasn't been going up recently. I assume everybody's been so busy. So. I wouldn't really care, though. I mean, if I decide to leave the sword off, I decide to leave the sword off. It just means it probably would, it would go in the downstairs gallery, but it wouldn't be going up on the website gallery. That's what I would guess.
But I don't. I decided I don't like the sword, so I'm just gonna putty in the hole in her butt. And if that means that instead of going to Reaper, she goes up for sale on my Patreon, well, then she goes up for sale on my Patreon. That's the way it goes. I'm just happy when I get them done. That's all. When I, when I get them done and they look nice, then I'm happy. Putty. Yep. Yeah, rounded objects are so easy to do. And it's like... So easy to suggest the shape and the roundness of them with NMM. Getting a little bit more of the shadow into here. Oh, then I misspoke. Oh, and I'm on the sword of Monique, Shadow Raven. What, the model that we're doing tomorrow? I was referring to, uh, since, since at the end of the stream, it is customary for me to tell you guys, like, which, which person we're working on tomorrow, which tiny plastic person. So tomorrow is Monique de Noir, chibi vampire, and I haven't decided. I think I might work on her black and her hair, but I might change my mind and work on the gold. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You know, I can, I can be a bit frivolous <laughs> every once in a while, a bit flighty. A little bit, little bit flaky to hear on what I want to work on every day of the stream. I just kind of like listen to my gut and go, what do I feel like working on today? Because it's all fun, right? But we got a fair amount of um, non-metallic metal, like tuned and, uh, you know, done better. Like we still have to do these areas. That area is going to be short. Highlight these little gold fringes down here. Um, we managed to get a lot of this cleaned up. That's a done. The shoulder still needs to be done. And the lamp still needs to be done. Uh, and she's got a little bit of things on her belt back here. But otherwise, yeah, I mean... She's getting there. She's getting there, guys. She really is. So what we did today... We... Worked on NMM. I added more shadows and a little bit more realism, um, kind of more realistic patterning of the light sourcing on all of this, plus her bracelets. Um, we blocked in some of the areas that were just like pale yellow. We added some of this orangey shadow to it to bring in some depth so that we can highlight it up next time. Um, we talked about hair color and why I would or wouldn't go with various hair colors and the fact that we're going to be puttying in her butt at some point. Um, I'll probably do that off camera though. Um, and then, yeah, that's pretty much what we did today. And then tomorrow is going to be Monique de Noir, Chibi Vampiris. Um, and we'll, we'll work on either like black hair, black cloth, or we'll do work on gold. That will be, that will be our task. Thank you all for coming along on our little trapes today. And I hope that you are having a lovely May so far. And yeah, who are we rating, Reaper? We are raiding Cleo. Super cool. All right, guys. I'm off. You have a fantastic day. Please come tomorrow as well. What show do we have? Do we have a show later today, John? Or and 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 ah, Luca. Right, right. It's the llama. It's the alpaca stream. Awesome. So come back for that, guys. And I will see you all tomorrow morning. Bye bye.